welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Routier and Commissioners for HMRC. The citation for this case is 2019 UKSC 43. And this is a tax case that has some very interesting implications for the UK's relationship with the Channel Islands. At the heart of this case is Beryl Coulter, who lived on the island of Jersey before she unfortunately passed away back in 2007. Her residuary estate was used to form a charitable trust that could benefit the elderly members of the parish where she lived. At first, this was all very straightforward because the executors of the will, who are also the appellants in this case, were domiciled in Jersey, and Ms Coulter's will made it very clear that the trust was to be governed by Jersey law, even though a number of the assets existed in the UK. The waters were somewhat muddied in 2010 when the executors retired as trustees of the charity and were replaced by a trustee who lived in the UK. As a result of this, the will was amended to make the law of England and Wales the law of the trust. Furthermore, the charity was then registered under English law. A few years later, in 2013, the other party to this case, HMRC, got involved by coming to the determination that the original gift made by Mrs Coulter to her own charity did not qualify for relief from inheritance tax as a gift to charities under Section 23 of the Inheritance Tax Act 1984. The reason that HMRC gave was that the relief from inheritance tax only applied to trusts that were governed by the law of a part of the UK. As we have already mentioned, at the time of the gift, the trust was governed by the law of Jersey, and for the purposes of Section 23 of the Inheritance Tax Act, Jersey was not a part of the UK. An appeal was made against this decision by HMRC, and the exact reasoning used by the appellants was very interesting. Essentially, it was submitted that the determination was not compatible with Article 63 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, which guarantees the right to the free movement of capital between EU member states and also between member states and third countries. The response to this argument by HMRC, though, is a little bit baffling because it seems they are trying to have their cake and eat it. Even though the original decision was based on the idea that Jersey law was not within UK law, the argument in court was that the gift was actually an internal transaction, all taking place within one member state. When the case went to the Court of Appeal, it was accepted that although Jersey was indeed to be regarded as a third country, the restriction on how relief under Section 23 of the Inheritance Act was to be applied was still justifiable under EU law, and so HMRC came out successful. The executors appealed once again to the Supreme Court, and that is where we picked the case up. The justices began by noting the common ground that did exist between the parties, and this is actually quite useful to set the scene. For a start, it is clear that Jersey is not a member state of the European Union. Beyond that, the free movement of capital under Article 63 does generally apply to gifts to charities. It is just not clear whether there is tax relief in this situation. The next step for the court was to consider the exact status of Jersey. Jersey is one of the Channel Islands, and its full name is the Bailiwick of Jersey, meaning that it is under the jurisdiction of a bailiff. For the purposes of international law, Jersey is not an independent state. The UK is responsible for its defence and for its international relations, and thus any treaty concluded by the British government can be extended to the island. This fits in with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which states that any treaty is binding on a country's entire territory unless a different intention is expressed. With that in mind, we turn to the Treaty of Accession from 1972 that brought the UK into the European Union in the first place. The status of the Channel Islands is dealt with in Protocol 3, and while this states that the free movement of goods will apply, free movement of capital will not. When this situation has previously arisen before the Court of Justice of the European Union, the decision has always been very simple because it is just a question of applying the relevant treaty of accession. For example, in the case of Prunus and Directeur des Services Fiscaux from 2011, 
the British Virgin Islands were held to be a third country, and so, in a similar fashion, Jersey is also to be considered a third country when it comes to the transfer of capital. That is good news for the appellants because it also means that the free movement of capital applies between the UK and Jersey. Therefore, the refusal to give tax relief under Section 23 of the Inheritance Tax Act 1984 is a restriction on that free movement. However, that is not the end of the case because it is possible for the court to conclude that the restriction is yet justifiable under EU law. On the surface, the provisions do not actually impose any restrictions on the free movement of capital and appear to be consistent with EU law, but that is not the whole story. In the 1956 case of Camille and Henry Dreyfus Foundation Incorporated and Inland Revenue Commissioners, what is now section 989 of the Income Tax Act 2007 was interpreted in such a way that tax relief was only available to trusts that were governed by the law of the United Kingdom. It is this way in which section 23 of the Inheritance Tax Act is applied that means it is incompatible with the free movement of capital under Article 63 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and is also unjustifiable. Given the primacy of EU law, it is Article 63 that takes precedence, and so Routier ultimately won this case against HMRC. By losing this case, HMRC lost out on more than half a million pounds of potential revenue, although it has to be said that this isn't overly surprising. As stated earlier in this episode, the argument from the government was not only weak, but also quite confusing as well. At the same time that they were arguing that Jersey is not in the UK, they were also arguing that Jersey was in the UK when it suited them. And whatever the correct interpretation of this point might be, it is hard to argue that it is anything but contradictory to make this type of suggestion. I'm also not sure that HMRC helped themselves by pursuing so aggressively a charity that is seeking to help the elderly. There is a wider argument to be had about the comparative value and efficiency of the public sector compared to the charitable sector, but this is probably not the place for it. Suffice to say that the overall approach of taking from the poor for the purposes of redistribution is not the greatest image you would want to portray, and the economic argument makes about as much sense as the government's legal argument, in other words, not very much. Coming back round to the legal case itself, and the way that EU law works means that the result should not be overly surprising. Free movement of capital is a central tenet of the European project, and an attempt to exclude this on an island that is between Britain and France was always going to be difficult. Finally, the case also emphasises the central role that EU law continues to play in our legal system. The Dreyfus case is from the 1950s, and has a long and important history deriving from that House of Lords decision, but as soon as it was found to be contradicting EU law, it comes crashing down, at least in certain contexts. Whether this is a good thing or not is part of what became the subject of debate during the Brexit referendum. On the one hand, these wide-ranging core principles help to establish consistency across the member states and ensure that everyone is playing by the same rules. But on the other hand, this case could also be seen as a perfect example of the UK not being able to set its own rules when it comes to how it chooses to operate a tax system. As the Brexit process rumbles on amidst election campaigning, it is these sorts of questions that remain a central feature of UK politics. Well, thank you very much for tuning into this episode of UK Law Weekly, and thanks as ever to bensound.com for providing the theme music. Remember, you can also sign up for my email newsletter by going to uklawweekly.com, and at the same time as you do that, you can also get access to my free guide for answering problem questions, which if you're a law student will hopefully be very useful, especially as we come around to this time of year when coursework tend to be due. So I hope you enjoy that and I'll be back with another episode of the podcast next week. But until then, bye.